Good morning, guys. Um, welcome to my hotel room in Kingston. And it's it's morning, so I have my morning voice. I uh, just woke up my CBC radio announcer voice. Okay, um, when I woke up, you were on my mind. Uh, I was remembering that I said I would talk to you a little bit about the stats part uh, of Chapter 2. Uh, I just rifled through my hard drive looking for the slides I used to show uh, when I walked through that. Um, which I apparently don't show anymore, which confuses me a bit as well. Uh, I, I couldn't track down the slides. So what I'm going to do is is hit the highlights with a concrete example. I think I think this is the the smartest um, way to kind of go about it. So it's going to be a little bit of hands on, um, and let's use this as a. Um, I guess a kickoff to, to see what questions or thoughts that you have, um, things you would want to follow up on with me. So what I'm going to do is use these data. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the idea of frequency tables. <coughs> these are what we'll hit, frequency tables um, and histograms. So I'm going to talk about you know, why you can go from data to those and what that does for us. Um, I'm going to talk about so-called measures of central tendency. Um, so this would include the mean, the median, and the mode. I'm going to talk about measures of variability. We'll kind of check these off as we go. So measures of, oh, okay, fine. Do it this way. Um, so of course, freak. Measures of variability. My goodness, yeah, okay, it's working. Um, and so, uh, mostly, I'll, I'll uh, well, we'll maybe go through something called the MAD to get to um, variance and standard deviations, which are the, the more commonly used ones. I'll explain why. So we'll do those things. Um, Everything that I've done up here um, is is what are called descriptive statistics. And so I'll also mention, after we've talked about those, the notion of inferential statistics, how they're different. And I'll give you a sense of, I mean, really, you've been playing with them already in that context of digital lab coat. But I'll give you a, a sense of how they work without digging into a whole bunch of details. We'll probably just kind of focus on t-tests a little bit and talk our way through t-tests. All right, cool. All right, that's that's the game plan. We've got it all um, laid out there. So just for a, a setup and to keep things easy, um, let's imagine we did a little experiment where we asked, I don't know, what is this, about 30 people from the class, um, if they would um, participate in this experiment, and basically everybody, just before um, they wrote a quiz, let's say it's a quiz out of 10, um, we either had them drink some coffee just before the quiz, or not drink coffee before the quiz. Um, you know, not the perfect uh, experiment, but uh, what we would probably do, by the way, um, is, is get them both to drink coffee, but one would be decaffeinated and the other wouldn't, and we wouldn't let them know um, which which is which. Uh, but it doesn't matter. The, for, for now, let's just say we want to know if, if having drank coffee recently affects your performance on the quiz. So we have all these people that didn't drink coffee, and we end up seeing how well they did out of 10. And we have these people that did drink coffee, and we end up seeing how well they did. Okay, so let me get to the first big question of statistics. Why? <laughs> why do we have to learn this stuff, and why is it relevant? Well, um, because we use data is, is the nutshell. You know, when, when, um, when you do an experiment, you end up with a set of numbers like this. And you want to go from these numbers to an answer to a question. And, and your question is, you know, does drinking coffee impact the performance on this quiz? Uh, so the only way to ever answer that question is by doing some statistics. Um, and by the end of this, I hope you'll have a, have a good sense of it. But we're going to kind of do that in two steps. The inferential statistics is really going to be about trying to answer that question. The descriptive statistics are kind of a starting place. It's And, and it's really this. like. Looking at a bunch of numbers like this, you know, theoretically, it's right in front of our face. Is, is coffee making a difference? Uh, you know, a bunch of numbers are really hard to digest when they are a bunch of numbers. Uh, and so one of the first things we like to do is <clears throat> 
transform the numbers in certain ways that make them easier to digest, easier to actually think about. So, for example, um, we can create something called a frequency table. Uh, and so a frequency table would work like this. Um, let, let's, uh, let's do it this way. Score and then freak for no coffee and freak for coffee. Um, okay, so I'll just do it that way just to uh, yeah, be super, super explicit what we're talking about here. Okay. So now what we can do is we could look at all the, the potential scores. I don't think there's any score below five, so we could start right at five. Um, and what we're going to do here, I don't think there's a score greater than nine, actually. Um, no, okay. So these are various scores, and you know, frequency is a fancy word for count. Uh, it literally is a count. So what, what I'm saying here is, uh, for these five, or for the number five, if we go to the no coffee, this is basically saying, how many number fives are there? And so we can go through this and go, okay, there's one, two, three number fives. How many sixes are there? One, two, three, four, four sixes. How many sevens? One, two, three, four, five sevens. How many eights? One, two, three, four eights. And how many nines? Sorry, my wife is um, feeding our dog. Um, Okay, cool. Usually I feed the dog. Uh, how many nines? Um, yeah, zero nines. You right? Don't see any nines over here. Okay. Now we can do the same thing for the for the coffee group. Um, how many fives? Um, no fives. Okay. How many sixes? One, two, three, four sixes. How many sevens? One, two, three, four, five, six sevens. How many eights? One, two, three, four eights. And how many nines? One, two, two nines. Okay. So, so we've summarized the data here now. Um, you know, this is the same data as that, but you can start to, well, literally see it. Um, when you look at these two side by side, you can see that this one has a lot more of the lower numbers. This one has a lot more of the higher numbers. So, so it's starting you know, to, to be a little bit more visible. The data is something you can look at and you can already get a sense of, you know, that it looks like there's higher scores over here than over here. You know, it kind of seems that way. Now, one of the things we will often do is is draw a picture, literally do a so-called frequency histogram. Um, and you guys have seen these these frequency histograms all over the place. So let me just kind of um, go to the magic Google, and we'll throw in a frequency histogram. Yeah. So things like this, okay. And really, this is just. So let's use this as a nice hard example. Um, sure. So the reason I picked this is because it actually shows the scores across the top two. So you see the scores here. Um, so what they've done, <coughs> excuse me, is first of all count how many of each, right? Two ones, um, five twos, four threes two fours and one five. Um, but what they've done is in addition to counting now, they've just plotted this sort of graph where the height of each bar equates to the number of that number, the frequency. <clears throat> and so that's why it's called a frequency histogram. So now you're, you get a nice sort of picture of the data. Um, so, you know, let's, let's kind of Look at this one too, and we don't really need the cumulative frequency. So, okay, this is a cumulative frequency one. Ah, we don't really worry about cumulative frequency. But just to show you how non-intimidating it is, you know, this first part was a number of scores and the frequency of each. The cumulative we just added, so 10 is 3 plus 7, 
and then we had two to twelve. So this is just the total frequency. So you can do a you can do a cumulative frequency histogram too that just keeps growing it. So so the idea is though <clears throat> you get a simple count, and then you plot that count, um, and that now gives you data that you can just look at. So you know, let's look at one of these. Um, these are this is an age histogram of people, but it just kind of shows you wh wherever the sample is. Okay, most of the people are somewhere in this in this band, the 30 to 60 sort of range, and you can even see that we have a lot here. You know, mostly, and we're going to call this a mode. Okay, so so let, why don't we kind of cross into into some of that? Once we have a distribution which is another word for this, a hist frequency histogram. <coughs> Man, I got frogs. <coughs> Excuse me. Frequency histogram, uh, but it's also called a frequency distribution or just a distribution. Uh, and once you get it to a distribution, now you can start to um, describe this distribution. So you can show the picture, and the great thing about the pictures is that um, all of the data is still there. Like, for example, if we go here, if all you gave was the frequency histogram, you could recreate these scores, right? This actually tells you there were there was two ones in your set and five twos. And so the data is still there. We haven't lost anything, um, but we've pictured it in a way. Um, and this picture kind of lets us zoom in on two characteristics. I sometimes in classes, I like to say, you know, imagine, um, you know, those people who always want to match you up with somebody. Um, and they say, hey, I met this person last night. And, and, and they look, uh, you know, they, they, I think they would be a great match for you. you you'd really like them. And, and you might say, you know, imagine they didn't have a, a picture of this person or anything. You, you might want to know something about them. And what would you want to know? Um, well, one of the things we often would put on, say, a, a dating site or something is our height and weight, you know, and that gives us a sense of the person. It gives you a, an idea of, well, I guess the person's general body size of some sort. Um, same idea with the distribution. We have this whole distribution, which is nice, but sometimes, you know, if we're talking about data, we don't necessarily want to, uh, if I'm up and hungry, excellent. Um, we don't <clears throat> necessarily always want to take every set of numbers and, and leave a picture like this in a, a journal article or something like that. Sometimes we want to summarize it even more. And when we summarize a distribution, we typically focus on two things. So not height and weight like we would with a human, but in a distribution, it's middle. Where's the middle? And how spread is it? How wide? How we're going to call this variability? So the middle ones we're going to call central tendency. Where's the middle? And the spread of the distribution we're going to call variability. Um, so let's talk about those one at a time. Middle. Um, central tendency. What the goal of those things are when you're trying to compute a, a measure of central tendency is you're trying to give a reader a sense of the typical data point, you know, the, the kind. So if you had to represent all of this data with one point, um, what's the, what would that point be? <clears throat> um, so it's, so it's sort of like, you know, creating a number that, that represents the whole sample as well as possible. And, and the number we pick is one that's sort of in the middle of that distribution. Now it turns out, there's a few different ways of doing this. The most common one is, of course, the mean. Um, and the mean, if we just write mean here, um, is, all we do is we add up the numbers. So it equals the sum of all the numbers. So we just, and then we divide by the number of numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 numbers. And there we have the mean. And let's just stretch this out and also apply it to this one. All right. Um, so these numbers uh, are the these representatives of the two samples. And, and you see, uh, once you get here, you're already starting to get a little bit you know, more information. It looks like these coffee people are doing better than the no coffee people. Um, is it enough bet to get excited by? Well, let's come back to that. Let's leave that for now. Um, <clears throat> the mean is the most commonly used measure, and that's the one you know best. Um, let me first say what the mean is. The mean is a number 
um, that simultaneously tries to be as close as possible to all of the numbers in the set. So it minimizes the distance between itself and every other number. So it's the point that it's almost like the following. Imagine there's an elastic band tied to all these numbers and you had to find some point where you're being equally pulled by all the numbers. Well, this would be the point. It's, it's being pulled down as much as it's being pulled up, etc. The one problem with the mean is that if you add um, what's called an extreme value, then things get screwy. So for example, this last one, instead of seven, if we made it 70, now the mean is 11.12. Um, if you kind of think about that number, is that a very good representative of these numbers? Well, not really, right? There's none of these numbers that's around 11. Um, it's, it, it's kind of strange. It's higher than the vast majority of the numbers and, and way lower than one. The mean gets pulled by these extreme values, gets pulled, you know, sort of far away from the center of the distribution. Um, so it's what's called sensitive to extreme scores. Uh, and, and that worries people sometimes. Now, it could be, by the way, that this extreme score is an error of some sort. Like if this was a quiz out of 10, that's obviously a, some sort of coding error. And, you know, you should never be able to get 70. Um, and, and in that case, you might just remove it. But in some cases, and, and the classic one would be things like income. If you look at uh, the income of Canadians, for example, what you would see is that you know most people are around one area, but there's some people making a stinking lot of money. And if we include those in the sample, then the average income can, can become inflated, almost exactly like we see here, where it looks much higher than, than it is for the vast majority of people. Uh, and so sometimes the people are worried about the mean because of that sensitivity to extreme values. So instead they will use something else. So there's something called the median <clears throat> that's also very commonly used. The median, what we, what we suggest is, well, what if you took these numbers and, and, and let's maybe do it the hard way, um, and you did them from, well, we kind of have it here from the lowest to the highest, what would you have? And so if you ordered these from the lowest to the highest, you can kind of see here, we would have three fives, followed by four sixes, followed by seven, sorry, five sevens, followed by four eights, right? So five, 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 six, 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 seven, 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 seven et cetera. Um, so imagine them in an order. <clears throat> How many do we have? 16. So we go to, we count eight over. So that would be three of those fives, four of those sixes, and then one of the sevens, and now we're eight data points in, right? Um, and so what we do now is the median would be the number between the eighth and the ninth data point. The eighth data point would be a seven if we rank order them, and the ninth data point would be a seven. So the median would be a seven for these. Um, <clears throat> let's just do it for this one too. Hopefully you're all, you're all cool with it. Um, this one, again, if we kind of rank order, we would have no fives, but then we would start with four sixes, and then six sevens, and then four eights, etc. cetera. Um, and so the median, again, would be between the eighth and the ninth. Where would that be? Well, we have four, and then five, six, seven. So the eighth would be a seven, and the ninth would be a seven. So this one would also have a median of seven. Now, the nice thing about medians is if this becomes 70, it doesn't change things at all. So let me just say what the median is then. So the median is the point that has an equal number of data points below it and above it. That's how it defines middle. Equal number of data points below versus above. Um, <clears throat> and so just because one becomes more extreme, one of the above ones, that doesn't change the median. Um, it's still just a point above. So it's not so sensitive to the value of that point, it's just sensitive to where it is if you've laid them out from lowest to highest. Um, and so that's, uh, that's where the median is. And, and <clears throat> people like that, it's less sensitive to extreme scores. Now there's also something called the mode. <clears throat> um, the mode is the most frequently occurring data point. And so you can see that here as well. The mode for these numbers is what? Five, uh, sorry, seven, because you have five of them. That's what you have the most of is sevens. So you have five of those, so that's the most. This one is also seven. That's what we have the most of there. Um, if you think of it in these terms, the mode is the highest bar. 
so that would be the mode of that. This would be the mode of this. Um, you know, there's the mode over there. Very easy to find a mode. It's the highest bar. Some distributions are bimodal. Um, here's the mode here, obviously. What would be a bimodal distribution? Um, just to show you. Yeah. Oh, 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 it's right there. So bimodal distribution would have two high points. Now they call this bimodal, this is the actual mode, but they're saying it kind of goes up and down and up again. And so it looks like it's got two tops. Um, and that's what we mean by bimodal. Okay, so the mode is literally that hump in the distribution. Okay, so those are measures of central tendency. Now, you know, when you look at that, you say, oh, well, based on median or mode, it doesn't look like coffee matters at all. They're the same. Um, that's sort of why, in a way, why a lot of people focus on, on the means, because the means are in a way a little more, they, they, they well, for one thing, they reflect more of the data. Um, well, I guess the median has all the data below and all the data above, but they're also sensitive to the actual values of the data in a, in a stronger way. So the means tend to be a little more richer, a, a little more sensitive, uh, and that's why we tend to favor them. But we always worry about those extreme values because we know an extreme value can pull a mean. All right, <clears throat> I have breakfast waiting for me downstairs. <laughs> but let me, um, let, let's hit a couple of these other points. Um, if we want to ask, is this, so what, this number is bigger than that number, right? I mean, it just is. Um, and, and anytime you have two samples, it's very unlikely you'd have the exact same mean. But what we really want to know is, is this enough bigger than that <clears throat> that we should think coffee is really doing something? That, you know, this, this, is, this is, well, what we're going to start saying is, is this a bigger difference than we would expect by chance? So let me unpack that. We randomly sample people and put them in these groups, and then they perform. Let's say we didn't even do the coffee thing. So we just call this group one and group two, but we didn't do anything differently for group one and group two. They just do it. Again, we're going to get different means. In fact, if we did this over and over, we kept putting people in 16 people in group one, 16 group two, different 16 people every time. We have them do the quiz, we get their means. We will always find that the groups are different because it just will depend who ends up in each group, right? So do all the smart, smarter people end up, or more prepared people, I should say, end up in group two or in group one. If, if more end up in one than the other, then that group will probably end up with a higher average. And so what we call that is chance variation. It, it's just due to who's in each group. Uh, and that's kind of the baseline um, that we want to use. You know, how much do people vary by chance? Um, and, and so how normal is it for two people to be different? And once we know that, then we can ask, well, is this difference much more than we would expect by chance? <clears throat> so we want to we get those measures of how much people are varying. Okay, that equates to, if we go back here, the width of the distributions, how wide they are, the variability, that's what we're going to talk about. And there's a, there's a sort of funny thing that happens with these scores, but uh, I'll mess your head up a little bit. One really easy way, and, and now I'm looking at these means and I, I don't like them. <laughs> um, oh well, I'm stuck with them. We'll work with them. Um, yeah, I just don't like them because the math is going to get a little messier than I want the math to get. But um, we'll, we'll start over here and this, this one will be a little less methy, messy, I think. <clears throat> What we could do if we wanted to ask, well, how much do people differ? And that's what we're really going to ask, variability. How much are people, is one person different from another within the sample? And once you have a mean, an obvious thing to do would be something called the mean absolute deviation. That is, we could go individual by individual and say, well, how far are they away from the mean? So if we did this in a real um, you know, sort of kludgy way. That's the first data point up there. Um, let me actually expand this a bit so we can keep, so we can see a little bit more of what we're talking about. There we go. Um, you can go data point by data point and look at how different it is from the mean. So this one's 0.75. Now it's 0.75 above the mean. Okay. Here's one of the weird things with the mean. If we just, so if we say we're going to just 
sum all the deviations. If we want the average deviation, right? The average deviation, you'd sum them all and you divide by the number. But if you sum them all, you get something weird here. So 8 minus 7.5 would be plus 0.75. Um, 6 is below, it's 1.25 below that number. 7 is 0.25 below that number. Um, the next 7, 0.25 below that number. The next 6, uh, I'm going to mess this up, I know I am. Um, 1. 0.25 below. I'm going to let you do this, <laughs> but if you just calculated, if you just summed like we did all of the deviations of these from the mean, you know what the value would be? Zero. You sum those up. Some of them are above the mean. Some of them are below the mean. Um, and what it turns out is you'd get a bunch that are minus numbers, a bunch that are positive numbers, and when you add them all together, they would be zero. That's kind of what the mean is. It's, it's kind of how the mean is mathematically defined. Uh, and so we can't just use the average deviation. You could use the, the mean absolute deviation, which says forget about the signs. So just say how far away is something from the mean. So the first one is 75 away. The second one is 1.25 away from the mean. The next one's 0.25 away. So now we're not we're not going to worry about whether it's above or below. We're just going to say how far is it from the mean, whatever direction. If you add those all up and then you divide by the number of these, you will get something called the mean absolute deviation. So we're using the absolute value to get rid of that deviation summing to zero thing. Um, and, and that's a perfectly valid way to do it. And you could you could calculate the difference as the MAD score. And there's, there's sometimes called MAD scores, which is kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> while that's perfectly reasonable, for reasons we can't get into in a lot of detail, um, some of the uh, mathematicians that worked on this preferred a different way of dealing with the fact that some numbers are above and some are below. Rather than taking the absolute value of the number, so just strap, stripping out um, the plus or minus, they squared the difference. Uh, and of course, when you square a negative number, it becomes positive. So this is another way to turn all the numbers positive. You know, absolute deviation, we just do it. We just make them all positive. But if we square the deviation, so in this case, <laughs> You know, uh, 8 is 0.75 above it, but we square that. Um, and so sometimes I don't really have my little square symbol here. I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> I can't. I don't know if I can superscript this. And, uh, this is the superscript. Anyway, you, you, you get the idea. Um, so 0.75 times 0.75. So there's that first deviation squared. And then we would go on to the next one, which was one point. Well, it was actually a minus 1.25, um, minus 1.25 times minus 1.25. Um, so number by number, we could say how, dif how different is it from the mean? And we could care about whether it's above or below. You know, So we have minuses for the minuses and pluses for the pluses. But when you square them, that will all disappear anyway. Um, and you will end up with a sum of the squared deviations which if you then divide by, um, no, don't worry about it. Oh, stop it. If you then divide by the number of deviations, um, you will have something called the variance. Okay. Um, and it doesn't like my bad. Oh, stop it. Okay, go away. Ugh. Sorry. Um, so that's what the variance is. The variance is just um, this. Let's say you know, the sum of, of the squared deviations from the mean all divided by the number of numbers. So it's really kind of that easy. Okay. Um, now, because we're squaring them all, we end up with a sort of large number because it's the sum of squares. So what we sometimes do to bring it back in line is use what's called the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance. So it's it's no different than 
really the variance. It's just almost a different way of expressing it. So, you know, when we square all these deviations, again, we're making them look bigger than they are. Uh, and so the square root kind of brings this down. So if we actually calculate these things, and, you know, again, the math was going to get really nasty here. Um, so I didn't do it. But if we, if we go to... Um, Standard deviation. Let's do that. So I think it's um, I think it's just standard deviation in Excel. So if I say, okay, take these numbers and compute standard deviation. That's not what it's called. Um, ST dev. There it is. Okay. Except I actually meant to do it here. Shh, don't hit. <sighs> um, fine. ST dev. Um, bracket, and now I give it the number. I should be equals this bracket, and I give it the number. Okay, there we go. Oh my goodness! <sighs> Sorry, this is too early in the morning to be doing Excel. Okay, so there's there's the standard deviation for those numbers. Um, and let's do this for the coffee numbers as well. Just extend it. Standard deviation. Oh, that's nice. Okay. So what this essentially tells us is that, okay, these guys, they have a mean of 6.625 and people vary about one point away from that mean. These are 7.25 and they vary about one point away from the mean. Okay. These measures of variability are important for the next step, but let's let's just you know slow down for a second here and just say what we've got here now is that um, we've we've gone from sort of a picture, so we could do a frequency histogram which captures the numbers well, but we also can just capture them with these two numbers. We can now say the no coffee group had a mean of six point six two five and a standard deviation of one point oh nine, basically. And the coffee group has a mean of 7.25 and a standard deviation of 1. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing people would put in a results section to just let the reader, you know, instead of showing them all this data, which means nothing to them, let the reader kind of think about the data in a, in a clean, efficient way by kind of representing it with just a pair of numbers. Okay? Um, so it allows you to represent data easily. Okay, everything we've been doing has been in the um, realm of descriptive statistics. We're just describing the data. That's all we're doing. We're using math to let us describe the data more efficiently. That's often step one. But of course, we went into all of this wanting to know whether coffee made a difference. Um, and so to answer that question, we want to make an inference from our data. We want to do inferential statistics. And to answer that question, Virtually every statistics, every statistic you create um, takes this form. Statistic, statistic equals some measure of your effect divided by um, some measure of chance variability. Uh, so t tests and, and various other things, they all kind of boil down to the same same formula. So literally, if we want to say, is this bigger than this? Well, this is our measure of the effect, right? This is the amount of difference coffee produced. And, and what was it? Well, about 0.625 more here, right? So we could actually do the difference between the means. So, so our effect here is um, 7.25 minus 6.625 which equals um, 0 0.625. So that's, that's the measure of the effect coffee is having, and that's what we would put on the top of this formula. Um, but, uh, but we would want to say, okay, but is that big? Well, big relative to what? Big relative to the normal amount of variability that's going on. So these standard deviations allow us to assess how much variability is normal. Um, yeah, I gotta get down to that to that thing. So um, 
So I'm going to keep this at a high level. So what we do is we take our effect size, we divide it by some measure of var variability, and we get a statistic, in this case, a T statistic. Um, and then thanks to other people who've done all this math and calculus, we can say, hmm, okay, my T statistic ends up to be whatever, 3.2. How likely is it to get one that big by chance? Okay, so we get a p-value, which is the probability of seeing a statistic as big as the one you see by chance. And if that probability is really small, then we say, okay, this isn't chance. There's something else going on. Okay, uh, and that allows us, if the p is usually less than 0.05, so less than a 5% chance that this difference that we saw occurred by chance alone then we say, okay, I don't think it's a chance thing. I think the coffee is actually doing it. Um, and so that's the inferential step where we use the numbers to actually reach a conclusion. All right, I do have to go, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it for here for now, but this will at least get things going and let's pick it up in office hours if you have questions um, and, and we can go further from there. Okay, cool, I'm gonna shut this down.